You know, the readings for this Sunday on Holy Trinity Sunday all speak about the mystery of God, who was one, yet three persons. Despite this great mystery, there's so much we can learn from the Holy Trinity. And one of the great lessons of the Holy Trinity that can be taught to all of us is, but the majority of you is this. We can learn an awful lot from the Trinity when it comes to marriage. Most of you are married. Most of you who aren't married will be married one day. So what the church teaches then through the Most Holy Trinity is that the central mystery of the Christian faith is indeed the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. See, that's not just some nice idea. The Trinity has to do with everything. It touches every aspect of our lives. God, who is love, who in, in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is a community. And he pours his love and his life into our hearts, most especially through the sacraments, most especially through the Eucharist, and of course, through matrimony. See, don't forget, every prayer we pray is Trinitarian. Even if you think you're just praying to just one of the three persons, you can't separate the three. At every single Mass, we praise and worship the Father through the Son in the unity of the Holy Spirit. Here at Mass, the Trinity is everywhere. And our psalm today tells us in a very striking way that it is especially in the human person, in you, that the glory of God, the glory of the Trinity, can be seen. The human person, created male or female, you're creating the image of God. So it's a wonderful thing then to see the Trinity reflected and lived out in concrete and specific ways in the Christian family. And the Christian family is founded on the covenant of the gift of self between husband and wife. And not just the Christian family, all of civilization is based upon marriage, the husband and wife coming together. So for those of you who are married, you're not just sharing space with this other person you call your husband or your wife, or sharing space with those ones running around the house you call your children. If you're doing it right, and so many of you are, you're living out a covenant, which is why marriage is a sacrament. Okay, once again, What's a covenant? A covenant is an agreement based on a vow. So it's something very serious that says, my life for yours. I give you everything that I am. I receive everything that you are. That's a covenant. And that's what we do every time you go to witness a Christian wedding. It's also what we do every time you come to receive Holy Communion. Exact same thing my life for yours. Lord, I give all of who I am, I receive all of who you are. Now, if you can live out this covenant in your marriage, in your family life, something great's going to happen. You'll be a mirror of the Holy Trinity itself. A husband or wife not dominating the other, not consuming the other, but totally respecting the other in love that leaves room for a third person a child, the fruit of the relationship. That's a very close, not exact, of course, but a close description of the Holy Trinity. The Father loves the Son. The Son loves the Father so intensely that love between them is another person, the Holy Spirit. So Pope St. John Paul II famously said, families become what you are. In other words, husbands, wives, children, all of you need to become what you are. Well, what are you? You're a person made in the image and likeness of God, which means what? You are made for covenant. You are made for my life for yours. You're made for communion. You're also made to bring to the entire world the love of the Trinity. That's what you are. Now, all of us come from families. All of us are also called to the great family of God that is the Church, through which we can especially shine the life of the Divine Trinity. But so far, what I've been talking about in this homily is the ideal, it's the goal, because many of us have fallen short of that. For far too many families, there is no covenant. There is no communion. For many, there's just division and anything but the presence of the Holy Trinity. So I'm going to briefly cover some points to help all of you strengthen your marriages. 
that for those of you who are young and little, oh, I'm going to take a nap, man. I'm not going to get married for another 20 years, okay? 20 years will be here like that, man. You better pay attention here, okay? But for those of you who are single and you're perfectly happy with that, I'm good, man, okay? But for those of you who are widowed or divorced, I ain't going to marry again. I'm done, baby, okay? You got to still be to pay attention because we got to pray that these things are able to be applied to those who are called to marriage. So here are the three quick points. For those of you who are married or who will be married, keep in mind. Number one, a marriage is made up of three. Marriage itself is Trinitarian. There's the husband, the wife, and God. How many couples have forgotten that? So there they are trying to figure out everything on their own with little or no help from God. Now sure, it's awesome to come to Mass as a couple, to come to Mass as a family, that's beautiful, okay? But searching for God, the reception of the Holy Spirit, that can't stop as soon as you hit the parking lot. See, for so many people, they have this little sliver of time in the week that they donate to God. It's called going to Mass. Whole rest of the week, ooh, forget about it. No, the whole, everything has to be touched by the Holy Trinity. God is part of your marriage in everything. Don't you separate that. It's all together. So that means what? Well, you, you've got to pray. You have to pray hard. You have to seek the Lord in and through every aspect of your marriage. Because, man, some of you don't even pray grace before you eat. See the enchiladas map? <laughs> Boom. Okay? Well, wh where, do you think the, where do you think that came from? Ultimately, it came from God. Okay? So crank up the awareness of the presence of God and pray to him and with him constantly in your marriage. Second, the church teaches that the definition of marriage is the permanent and exclusive union of one man and one woman for the good of the spouses and for the procreation and education of children. Now many of you have been so faithful to that, so very, very faithful. For some of you, you've been faithful physically. You've not had an actual physical affair with somebody else, but mentally or emotionally, Many of you have forgotten, marriage is exclusive, meaning it's one man for that one woman forever. Now, why do you have to bring this up? Because there are some husbands who don't see anything wrong with looking at another woman, especially when it comes to the curse that is pornography. That's not being faithful. And for the women, it would be just as bad. Reading those crazy romance novels, seeing those fantasy movies, all to escape from you know who, all right? That's the one you're supposed to be giving your attention to. But another part of the problem of not being exclusive is it can quickly lead to deep selfishness. I tell the couples I do marriage prep with all the time, you cannot allow one ounce of selfishness into your marriage. You can't afford it. And many who are married have stopped putting their spouse first and the children second. That's what it's supposed to be, with God, of course, being number one above all of that. If you're number one on the priority list, if everybody has to wait for what they need to serve you, you know what you got to do as soon as Mass is done? You got to go turn on your number one badge, get knocked down a few steps down that ladder. That's what it's supposed to be. We're supposed to serve one another, especially in our vocations. Because marriage is based on the gift of self, not selfishness. You who are married, you cannot forget. If you're doing it right, and like I said, many of you are, the person you're sharing your life with is your number one ticket back to heaven. You also are his or her number one way of getting back home. That's part of why God put you guys together. Do you think you just got had a nice job, nice car? Man, a lot more than that. That's your number one ticket back home. In God's plan, of course, with God's help, you can not only not, not just be exclusive, you can actually cherish and be wonderfully filled with joy of being the best and main way for your spouse to get back home to God. Third, you guys know the biggest problem that couples who are engaged have? This is by far the biggest problem. It's so big, if it's not taken care of, it will affect the marriage every single time. Because life has a way of beating us up sometimes, breaking our hearts, giving us crushing defeats, great disappointments, especially in our relationships with others. Sometimes we end up having a crack or a hole or a gap in our hearts. 
We go along in our life, we meet this other person, hey, just kind of working out here. There's some attraction there. But he or she also has a crack or a gap or a hole in their heart. The great mistake comes when couples think, hey, we can fill each other's hearts. We can be the ones who fill in the gaps. And then, you know, of course, that's emphasized by the phony Hollywood movie type of mentality where the couple says all starry-eyed, you complete me. Uh, no, you don't. <laughs> I hate to break this to you, but you can't complete somebody else. You cannot fill the gap or fix the broken heart of somebody else. Only God can. Only God can. He made that heart. That heart belongs to him. He lets you share that with that other person. So here's what's at stake. If broken people marry other broken people, you're going to have broken kids. And the pattern will continue sometimes for generations. The problem is that many couples do not let God make them whole, make them strong and confident first, before the marriage. Because if you don't, a whole lot of that baggage, the garbage from the past is going to creep into the present, and you've got to deal with it. Let God take care of your heart first. For those of you who've been married 23 years, well, it's not too late. You still come to our Lord and have him fill whatever might be missing in your heart. That's no problem for God. You can change if Jesus is the one changing you. You can become more holy, more loving, more sincere if it's the Holy Spirit who's moving within you. But you have to give your entire heart over to our Lord and trust him to make you whole. Because ultimately, you guys ready for this? I better get the dustpan out, man. I'm going to blow your minds in just a second here, okay? All right? <laughs> Ultimately, Christian marriage is not about finding the right person. W what? No, it's not. God has already done that for you. He's already found the right person for you if he, indeed he's calling you to that vocation. No, marriage is not about finding the right person, but about becoming the right person. And part of the problem of becoming the right person, like the song says, so many people are looking for love in all the wrong places. Well, guess what? You've come to the right place today. Love itself in the presence of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is here waiting for you. And from that love, the Holy Trinity will be with you to help you to be the best husband and father, the best wife and mother you can possibly be. But remember what St. Bernardine of Siena once said, even as you seek a virtuous, fair, and good spouse, it's fitting you should be the same. Don't you simply lean on your husband and wife to be the holy one in the family, to be the loving one. You be the holy one. You be the loving one. You be the one who brings the presence of God, the presence of the Trinity to others, beginning with the family.